according to university regulation, we have to wait acad the academic 10 minutes to allow students and faculty to come from other sides of the campus and so on. So in the meantime, what I do is I will uh, use this for a little bit commercial. Uh, for many of you, you may be the first time you ever hear of something called ASNT, you know. Uh, ASNT is a graduate group and ASNT stands for Applied Science and Technology. It's kind of a loose family or coalition of students and faculty uh, who are interested in research in areas that sort of uh, overlap with both science, basic science, and uh, technology and engineering. Uh, we are a group which consists of uh, over 60 faculty members spread over three colleges, and we have uh, currently over 30 graduate students enrolled in this program. However, for all this uh, activity and size, we don't have a department of our own. We don't have a building of our own. So uh, it's not very common that we can all gather together under one roof. We do have a few uh, activities throughout the year where we try to gather together. So uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, feedback we got from the students is that sort of they don't feel uh, a fa a sort of a feeling of family like in the department. So they would like to have uh, more opportunities to interact with each other on a scientific basis. So one of the proposals that came forward is to organize a uh, colloquium every, uh, every month. So uh, you are our sort of uh, first experiment. This is ex for most department, of course, uh, it is common to have colloquiums, monthly or weekly colloquiums, uh, and also in addition to have seminars. So for us, this is the premiere. And uh, also uh, what is a little bit unique in this case is the uh, colloquiums, uh, colloquia, are organized by the students. We have a very active organization called Students of uh, ASN, the ASNT Student Society. So the students, they contact the speakers, they uh, are select the dates and so on. So the only thing the faculty did was to give them our blessing. So uh, today, uh, you can see that they have been very successful in uh, putting together a very uh, exciting series. To kick off this series, uh, we will have today Professor Tang from uh, Physics Department. Actually, I take this opportunity to announce the next talk. The next talk will occur on October the 18th, and the talk will be given by Professor Richard Muller of Physics Department. Well, in case you think that this is all run by the Physics Department, since I uh, belong to the Physics Department, uh, they also have uh, already contacted Professor Ron Gronsky to be uh, one of the speakers in the future colloquium. So you can see that they have put together really a roster of superstars on this campus. Um, so now that we have satisfied the 10-minute uh, uh, requirement, I will now hand over the podium to Andy Eckler, who is our president of the uh, ASNT Student Society, and he will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So I. It's my privilege to introduce Professor Charles Towns. Uh, as you probably all know, Charles Towns received the Nobel Prize uh, for the concept of the maser and the laser. And he's been involved heavily in physics and astrophysics for, um, on Berkeley campus since uh, the 60s. And his current research interests are in infrared astronomy, specifically infrared interferometry. And it is appropriate that he is giving our inaugural uh, colloquium today, Be, um, especially on the topic, as we are a very interdisciplinary group. His and he is one of the f uh, first interdisciplinary and also applied physicists to do uh, m much research in the area, especially since he came up with the concept for the maser and the laser. He will be talking today on the on discovery and creativity in science. So, if you could. Okay. 
help me in welcoming Professor Towns. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Can you all hear me all right? Back in the back row, do you hear me all right? Okay, good. Well, I'm going to talk about discovery and creativity and new ideas. Where do new ideas come from? Well, the things we don't know yet. And they frequently come in surprising ways. Uh, and I'm going to try to illustrate that. And they come from interactions of all kinds of different things and ideas that come in from odd places and they're surprises and things we don't really believe initially. Uh, now, um, I'll illustrate this in part uh, with my own experience, but also from other people's uh, inventions and ideas. I was a student, graduate student at Columbia University, and I thought, of course, the university is a place to really explore science and do the right things. But this was in the 1930s, and there just weren't any jobs in universities. And, but Bell Laboratories offered me a job, and my professor said, oh, you should take that. That's Bell Labs a good place. Oh, I didn't want to go into industry. I wanted a university where we could uh, have new ideas. Well. Okay, but they gave me a good salary and it was the only job I offer I had, so I went to Bell Labs. Now Bell Labs also was willing to let me just do physics, of all things, for a little while, but then the war came along and we all had to work on the, trying to help in World War II, and so I was assigned to do radar. Oh dear, I had to do engineering. <laughs> Is that creative? I wanted to find out new things. I had to do engineering. Well, okay, so I learned about microwaves. I learned about microwaves and um, uh, did engineering and I learned a lot of things that were very important to me. I hadn't realized that. One thing that the radar found out was that there were water molecules that absorbed microwaves. One and a quarter centimeters absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere and that spoiled certain kinds of radar. And I looked at that and interested. And after the war, I said, hey, well, that's something I might study. Uh, I might try to, f I, it looks like you can do spectroscopy with microwaves of all things, get very high resolution, get very good information, very precise information about molecules and the nuclei that are within them. So the Bell Laboratories fortunately let me do that, study microwave spectroscopy. Was that of use? from the point of view of uh, engineering or applications. Well, the Bell Laboratories anyhow let me do it. And it was out of that field that the maser and the laser developed. Now, of all things, would you expect a strong light source to come out of the study of microwave spectroscopy molecules? But that's where it came from. There were three independent ideas about lasers and masers. One of them was the Russians, and they were doing microwave spectroscopy of molecules. And one of them was a uh, guy at the University of, of Maryland, uh, and uh, he, uh, he didn't have very strong ideas, but he was also working in the field, and he had some idea. And let me illustrate now how that came about. I was doing microwave spectroscopy in, at centimeter wavelengths, and I wanted to get to shorter wavelengths and millimeter wavelengths. Well, we could make Clystrons that maybe went down to a few millimeters, couldn't get much shorter. I wanted to get on into the infrared and do, have oscillators in the infrared to get very high resolution then and do better spectroscopy in the infrared, down below a millimeter wavelength. And I worked on that. My students tried various ideas of mine. They didn't work very well. And the Navy knew I was interested, and they made me chairman of a national committee to try to examine how could we get to shorter waves? How could we get oscillators at shorter wavelengths? And we toured all around and tried to find out ideas, and none of them. And the last meeting we were having in Washington, and uh, I woke up early in the morning worrying about it. We hadn't been able to get anywhere. I went out and sat on a park bench. Now, why hadn't we been able to get the right idea to get short waves? Thought about this and that. Well, of course, molecules produce short waves, but I always knew that. But uh, to produce very high intensity, you had to heat them up uh, very high. Had to heat them up so hot that they would fall apart. And, oh, no dear. Well, 
Uh, yes, molecules could, could oscillate at those wavelengths, but they couldn't produce much energy. I, I thought about, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. They don't have to be defined by a temperature. Molecules would be in up in a state and a lower state, and the difference between the populations depends on temperature, but they don't have to be defined by temperature. In the laboratory at Columbia University, where I was then working, uh, some of my friends separated molecules in a molecular beam. You could send a, a molecule in a molecular beam and deflect the molecules in one state from those in another state, select them in separate states. Hey, wait a minute, we don't have to be defined by temperature. You can pick out molecules in a high energy state, oh, and then the amplifier, oh, wow, hey, wait a minute, maybe that's it. And I quickly pulled out a pad of paper and wrote down some equations, and of course I was familiar with how molecules worked and, and the spectroscopy of them. Wrote down, hey, it looks like, looks like it'll work. Well, I was a little uncertain about it, so I never mentioned it to anybody. Uh, at, the, at the meeting, we closed off the meeting, we didn't have any ideas. I went back home and I wrote it down in my notebook, yeah, it looks like it'll work. And pretty soon I got a student who was interested and willing to try it. Uh, now I decided to try it first in the microwave region because I had a microwave equipment, that was the first place to try it. So we tried it first there and I, the idea was to send molecules in a beam put an electric field to separate them out, pull out the ones in a high energy state, and then put them into a cavity where they could then produce energy and the cavity would reflect the energy back and forth across the molecules and rob the molecules of the energy and we would have an oscillator in the microwave region produced by molecules of all things. Well, I had worked on this for, oh, a year and a half or two years. The chairman of the department, Professor Cush, came in with Professor Robbie. Now, Robbie had been chairman, and he already had a Nobel Prize. Cush was to get a Nobel Prize. They were smart, smart people. He came to my and said, look, that's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You're wasting the department's money. You've got to stop. Well, fortunately, I had tenure then. I was an associate professor. <laughs> they couldn't fire me. Now, that's one good thing about universities, you see. Once you have tenure, you can't be fired just because somebody doesn't agree with you. Uh, if you do something immoral, yes, you can be fired, but not just because somebody doesn't agree with you. So they couldn't fire me. I said, no, I think it has a reasonable chance. I'm going to continue. Oh, well, they marched out of my office angrily. Well, about four months later, my student, Jim Gordon, uh, dashed into my, in, into my classroom. I was giving a lecture. He dashed into the class. Hey, see, it's working. It's working. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, uh, so the whole class went out in the laboratory to see it, and it was working. Uh, he had oscillations produced by molecules, and so, uh, great, that was the first one. And my students and I tried to figure out what to call it. Well, we picked out the name MESA for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. You stimulate the molecules and you give up the energy. Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation, MESA. And of course, laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. My students thought of laser too, and also uh, erasers for infrared amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. <laughs> well, we'll never use that word. Or gazers for gamma ray amplification and so on. Uh, but anyhow, that was the origin of lasers. My student and I thought it up. Well, we had to find a name for this new device. Well, now, just to show you, uh, you see how new ideas have their difficulties. Uh, a few months later, I happened to be walking along the street in Europe with uh, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr is a famous scientist. I trust you've heard of him, the Bohr atom and all this. Niels Bohr, very great guy. And he said, well, what are you working on? And I said, oh, I'm, look, I've, I've got this oscillator. By the molecules give up the energy, and we've got very, very pure frequency in the microwave region produced by the molecules. Oh, he said, oh, oh no, no, that's not possible. No, you, 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 must, you, you must misunderstand something, something, no, that can't be. No, I said, oh yes, we've got it working. Oh no, and I said, yes, we've got it working. It has very narrow frequency. I think he was thinking of the uncertainty principle. The molecules go through the cavity in a finite time, the uncertainty principle says they have to have a bandwidth. No, they were much narrower, and that's the reason because it's a collection of molecules, not a single one. In any case, he said, well, well, maybe you're right, I don't know, and he, I don't think he ever believed me. Now, 
Another case, uh, uh, John von Neumann, a very, another famous scientist, excellent scientist, and I was a cocktail, Princeton, a co cocktail uh, uh, party at Princeton University, and uh, von Neumann asked me, well, what are you doing? I told him, I had this oscillator that very pure for, oh, no, 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 that can't be, uh, that can't be right, no, you must, un you, you must understand something, I said, no. I said, yes, we've got it. No, no, no. Well, well, he went off and got another cocktail, and about 15 minutes he came back later. Hey, you're right. <laughs> 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 well, now, you see, new ideas are frequently ones which people cast off. We have roadblocks in our thinking. We think along certain particular ideas. I had been thinking along particular ideas. I believed in thermodynamics, and thermodynamics says, oh, no, molecules can't produce more than a certain amount of energy. But that's assuming the thermodynamics applies, which it doesn't if you don't have a temperature. You have a selection of molecules not represented by a temperature. So we have these roadblocks. Now to illustrate these roadblocks uh, in, a, in a still another way, um, airplanes. Airplanes, of course, obviously airplanes exist. They were invented uh, some time ago and they exist. We know, everybody knows airplanes fly, but Lord Kelvin, in the very last part of the 19th century, Lord Kelvin, a wonderful British scientist, that's why he became a lord, <laughs> uh, he said the following, this is a quote, he says, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Now, not only he, but Lord Rayleigh, another very famous British scientist at that time, last part of the 19th century, Lord Rayleigh says, quote, I have not the smallest molecule of faith in aerial navigation other than ballooning. Balloons, of course, can be light on the earth, they can go up, but anything heavy now, well, no, of course, that, those can't work. Good scientists, convinced. Well, in 1903, the Wright brothers, they maybe didn't know enough physics to know it couldn't be done. <laughs> the Wright brothers flew an airplane, up it went. From then on, everything was changed. Now, um, an, an, another case of radio astronomy. When I was at Bell Telephone Laboratories, Jansky had just found radio waves coming in from outer space. Jansky was an engineer. He had just been measuring noise, and he found this radio waves coming in from outer space. He wasn't looking for them. He made a terribly important, very, very important radio astronomy discovery. And uh, when I left Bell Labs to go to Columbia University, I fortunately got a job at Columbia University after I'd been working in microwave spectroscopy. Now, and, um, but about that time, I was thinking of maybe I should do radio astronomy. And I talked with a very famous astronomer, I.S. Bowen, who was then head of Palomar Observatory and so on. I said, look, uh, I, I'm at Bell Labs. I know all about radar and so on, I'm expert in radar. and." Uh, I wonder, I've been wondering about doing some work on astronomy with radio waves. And what would you think would be the best thing to do? Bowen looked at me and said, well, I'm sorry, Charlie, but uh, I don't think radio waves will ever tell us anything about astronomy. Oh, <laughs> I didn't really believe that, but I didn't know what to do. So I did microwave spectroscopy of molecules instead. I continued to do that until I learned more about astronomy. But radio waves are very, very important in astronomy now. Lots of discoveries have been made. One of them is molecules. We found molecules in outer space with radio waves. And again, just to show you how we have roadblocks, uh, when I came to Berkeley uh, back in the late 60s, I thought, well, I'd like to look for molecules in space with radio waves. I think there should be some, and we can detect them with radio waves, with microwaves. And I talked with George Field, who was then head of the astronomy department here, a very famous astronomical theorist. And I said, you know, I, I, I want to look for microwaves, I want to look for molecules. Oh, you shouldn't do that, that's a waste of time. No, they can't be there. I can prove theoretically that molecules can't exist in space, they fall apart. They can't be there. Oh, well, no, no, I won't look anyhow. No, it was crazy. Well, Jack Welch, an engineer here, was willing to help me out. And uh, he had some radio antennas and we looked. 
and we found ammonia. A student of mine, Al Chung, found ammonia in outer space, oscillating, or uh, rather not uh, producing waves uh, in the microwave region, about one, one and a quarter centimeters again. And then we found, of all things, a water maser. A maser in outer space. They've been there all the time. Masers and lasers have existed in outer space all the time. Very, very powerful ones. Nobody had bothered to look. See, we've got to explore. We mustn't be fixing ideas. Now, also, I want to emphasize how important my engineering experience was to all this. See, my engineering experience gave me experience in microwaves and how to do things. And also, it taught me about oscillators. Physicists didn't worry about oscillators and feedback very much. And uh, when I invented the maser, it was my engineering background. It was enormously helpful in understanding I could, how to do feedback and how to make a feedback oscillator and so on. So the interaction between different fields is very important. And uh, uh, my, what little information I had about chemistry and molecules, that was, uh, that, was important, uh, that was important to me also in understanding molecules. Uh, now, uh, this interaction is enormously important. Unfortunately, the fields of physics and engineering are getting closer together. And the different fields of, of, uh, of science are getting closer together. Biology and physics are getting more closer together now. And that's very important. Biology is becoming more fundamental. And physics and chemistry are going to contribute a very large amount to biology. So the interaction between different fields the willingness to explore, our openness. Now, we want, to, we want to be open in our thoughts and be willing to try new things. We've got to be thoughtful, though, not waste our time on things that are wrong. So we want to understand as much as you can, understand as much as you can, understand as much as you can about different fields, get experience in fields that other people haven't had, and so on, and mix the fields together. Particularly, I think engineering and science mixed together are very important, both to science and to engineering, as you can see from the field of lasers. Now, let me talk a little bit more about how lasers came about. You see, we had been working on microwaves, masers, for some time. Nobody was interested in the maser when I was trying to build it. But once we built it and had it working, oh, oh, everybody got excited. It was a very exciting field then. A lot of people worked in the field. It became so exciting that Lots of papers in the physical review. The physical review editor told me, well, you know, I'm getting so many papers on masers, I think I'm going to just have to turn down any further papers on masers. We've got too many. Uh, everybody's working on it. But nobody was trying to produce lasers at shorter wavelengths. They thought, oh, well, no, that can't be done because, you know, the molecules fall down from upper state to lower state very much faster at shorter wavelengths, and you can't get them up there and so on. So, no, you can't do that. And we can't have a, we can't have a resonator. Uh, uh, at short waves either. You can't build a resonator like we did in the microwaves, a little cavity at short waves, and uh, so on. Well, but I wanted to get to shorter wavelengths. So after the maser had been going, the maser was first made in 1954. Three years later, 1957, I said, look, I, I want to get to shorter wavelengths. I don't see how to do it. I've just got to sit down and figure out the best way to do it. And uh, so I sat down and thought about it. Well, I felt, oh, wait, we can excite molecules and atoms with intense radiation. We can excite them up to an upper state. And then uh, maybe get uh, more in the upper state than the lower state and amplify. And we'll put them in a little cavity. I think we can make a, 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 make a cavity much bigger than the wavelength. And OK, the waves will oscillate back and forth. We won't have a single mode. But uh, at least we can get some oscillations. And so I wrote all this down. I was consulting at Bell Telephone Laboratories at that point, and my brother-in-law, Arthur Shallow, had worked with me as a postdoc and then gone to Bell Labs. He was there. And of course, I went around and talked to him. Said, you know, I've got this idea. Maybe we can produce a maser at short wavelengths, infrared and optical wavelengths. I told him about it. And, oh, he said, that's, that's, that, that's interesting. I, I'd like to work on it with you. OK. Well, he, put in, he had the idea then of using two parallel mirrors as a cavity. See, I'd been thinking of cavities all the time with walls around them. 
and there'd be oscillation all right with two parallel mirrors you can get waves going straight back and forth but if they go out then they won't oscillate so that makes a good oscillation at one particular frequency one particular mode so that was his idea and we wrote a paper about it now at that time i knew everybody once we expressed the idea everybody would get interested because everybody's interested in mesas and so we decided well we'll write a paper on the fact that it could be done and how to do it and then we'll try to do it so we wrote a paper we served this paper and talked about it and then everybody started working on it a lot of people started working on it <coughs> there was a real competition to build the first major but uh, operating the, the light waves <coughs> excuse me uh, <coughs> I wanted to do it, but I was asked to go down to Washington at that time to advise the government, and I felt, well, gee, I have a kind of obligation to try to help out. So I agreed to go down to Washington for two years. My students were working trying to build the first laser, but I couldn't help them out very much. <clears throat> and uh, now a lot of people were working on it. The first laser actually was built by Ted Maiman at Hughes. Ted Mayman, I, 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 I hadn't had. You see, the growth of a field depends on a lot of different people. Art Shallow's idea and Ted Mayman's idea. Ted said, oh, you can get a lot more energy in a light by pulsing it. You make a pulse of light with a quick flash, you get more energy and excite a lot of molecules in. And maybe temporarily, then you can get a lot of molecules in an upper state make a laser. And he did it successfully. He built the, the first laser. Now, Ted Maiman had worked in microwave spectroscopy also as a student. And he was a kind of a new student who had gone to Hughes. And after that, a lot of different lasers, kinds of lasers were invented and built. The next one was Ollie Javon and a couple of other people at Bell Laboratories. Bennett, Javon and Bennett had both worked in microwave spectroscopy and then gone to the industry. So all the first lasers were built in industry. Well, the industry was now interested. Industry, industry suddenly got interested and said, oh, hey, this is a good field. After mesas had been found. Now, before mesas were found, industry wasn't very interested in the field that, from which they developed. Microwave spectroscopy, Bell Labs was generous enough let me work in microwave spectroscopy. I had a number of friends in General Electric, uh, for example, who worked on microwave spectroscopy. General Electric shut them down. Several other companies, people started working, those who had microwaves, started working on microwave spectroscopy. Well, thank you. But the company shut them down and said, look, that's not of interest to us. That's not going to produce anything we can use. So they shut them down. Bell Labs was generous enough to let me continue. But once mesas had been found, then the industry was interested. Hey, wait, there's something in it. And it was very interested, and amp they were good amplifiers, good oscillators, and so on. And by the time the laser idea came along, oh, they were very interested. But all the new lasers then were built in industry, not in universities, because industry could put a lot of effort in it quickly. But they were built by people who had worked in universities on microwave and radio spectroscopy. Every one of them. Uh, the next laser, uh, Ali Javon and Bennett were at Bell Labs. They, in, they invented the uh, discharge laser. Next laser, solid state laser, was invented at, uh, at uh, General Electric. And again, by a guy who'd been working in uh, basically um, the radio field. So they came along. This is a, this is the way you see field gets created in surprising ways and directions that industry and nobody can figure out beforehand. We've just got to explore. I think we must urge industry to explore. Now, um, I might mention a few other developments that you're well, very well familiar with, of course. Our understanding of the universe. Galileo, of course, first discovered that we are going around the sun, not the reverse. 
we're going around the sun. The, the earth is not the center of the universe. And most of the religious people felt, oh, the earth is the center of everything and so on. And they didn't like the earth going around the sun. But Galileo discovered that, completely changed our philosophy. And the church eventually had to, had to agree. Uh, <coughs> but um, more recently, there's been a change in philosophy that there's the beginning of the universe. Now Einstein in particular, when he wrote his general equations about relativity and gravitation, he wrote equations, he was sure the universe had always been the same. Of course, you can't have an initiation of the universe, you can't have a beginning. Now you see, our, our idea is it's, it's, it's good for us to have a philosophy and have what, what we think is most likely right, but we've got to be open-minded. Einstein thought, of course, the universe can't have a beginning. It's always been the same. Well, then the Hubble expansion was found. Hubble found that uh, galaxies are moving away from us. Oh, Einstein was surprised. He had to put n a, a new constant in his equation, but thought, well, still, it has to always be here. Uh, and I'm, I, I feel very fortunate that It was one of my students, Arnold Pengius and Bob Wilson, and again at Bell Labs, who accidentally discovered the universe really had a beginning. How did that discovery come about? Again, completely in a surprising way. They were simply trying to measure noise. Now they're using a maser amplifier. Arnold had worked on mesas and they used a maser amplifier and I'd asked him to look for hydrogen in outer space between galaxies which he didn't find. So that's something I looked for, so I had him look for something, he didn't find it, but he wrote his thesis on it and did a good job. And he went to Bell Labs and continued to work on this kind of thing, looking in outer space. So just to look at what noise was out there. And he, he and Bob Wilson found there was a small microwave noise continuum coming in from outer space, corresponding to a temperature of about three degrees. What in the world was that? Well, it was soon recognized and that was due to the initiation of the universe, the Big Bang. The Big Bang, the universe exploded, made a lot of waves, and these were waves left over from the Big Bang, which occurred about 13 billion years ago. Many people didn't want to believe it, uh, but that completely changed our views again. Now, Fred Hoyle, a very famous physicist and astrophysicist in Great Britain, Fred Hoyle, he was sure that couldn't be right. No, you can't have a beginning. That's crazy, philosophically crazy. Is there any beginning of the universe? No, you can't have a beginning. He recognized the Hubble expansion, the universe is expanding, but the universe had to always be the same. So he insisted, well, we must be creating new atoms. We're creating hydrogen all the time in our universe, and that makes it the same density. Even though it's expanding, it stays the same density. It always stays the same. He worked on that idea for a long time, insisting that had to be right. Well, he wasn't right. I'm not sure he ever really completely agreed, but everybody else agreed, yes. The universe did have a beginning of all things. Now again, you see a complete revolution in people's thinking. Thinking not just of simple people, but people, very sophisticated people, Einstein, Fred Hoyle, other people. How can the universe have a beginning? We still don't understand the beginning very well. How can there be such a beginning? It, of course, has a great deal to do with our philosophical thoughts and our religious thoughts, even. Uh, and so as we explore and find out new things, by accident, yes, you might say, Penzis and Wilson, that's a complete accident. They found this. Well, no, not exactly. They were looking. They weren't looking for the beginnings of the universe, but they were looking for something new, see what was there. That's what we need to do. We need to explore. We need to be open-minded. We need to think. We need to interact with different people and different things. And uh, as time went on, more and more people have contributed to all of these things. If you look at the laser, the laser has developed and developed. It's now, uh, we get down into the x-ray region, uh, and we have enormously powerful lasers. A laser puts out more power than all the power used on the average in the United States. The power density is very high. 
It also can be very delicate. Laser tweezers can pick up molecules of uh, 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 cells very gently and place them different places. Laser doing a fantastic variety of things. Could I foresee that? No. I knew the laser was useful, uh, but not many people did. Even when the laser was first found, people thought it was very interesting and people were interested, but they didn't know that it was going to be very useful. In fact, several of my friends said, oh, well, that's a great invention, but it's an invention looking for, looking for a purpose. What good is it? What can it do? Now, even the Bell Laboratory's lawyers didn't understand this. I told Art Scholar when we uh, had the laser idea and put it down carefully, well, you take this Bell Lab, since I'm consulting the lab, Bell Labs, I guess the patent ought to belong to them. You take this Bell Lab patent lawyers and have them patent it. Well, okay. He called me up next week, said, well, they say they don't think they want to patent it uh, because light has never been of any use for, for communications. Uh, <laughs> And so they don't want to patent it. If you, if you want to patent it, they'll just give the patent to you. I said, well, no, they're just all wrong. You know, we mustn't cheat Bell Laboratories just because they don't understand. You go talk with them and tell them, yes, it can be communications. You can send light waves and pulse them, and uh, you can send light waves and communicate. So he took it back. They said, well, OK, all right, well, we'll patent it. So they patented it. Uh, now, of course, it's used in communication, <laughs> fantastic communication can get wider bandwidth, more information transfer than radio waves, enormously more. And it's useful in an almost variety of ways for medicine. I never thought of it as medical applications, of all things. But boy, it, it saves people's eyes. I'm just very thankful that it saves people's eyes. Friends comes up to me and says, the laser is cured my help, help my eye and cured my eye. Oh boy, that's very, very meaningful. I never thought of that. Sure, I could foresee some uses of the laser, and I had a lot of scientific uses, but many, many of the uses I didn't foresee, and other people have contributed, and other people contribute, add on, and do things, and that's the way science and technology develops. We want to interact with other people, interact with other fields, we want to be open-minded, learn all you can, think hard, and frequently, in order to do something new, you've got to work hard. You work and work and work, and then suddenly, Maybe there's a revelation. So best of luck to all of you. Enjoy it. Uh, first of all, is there any questions? Any questions for Professor Chat Towns? One. Uh, Charlie, I understand you are also a highly religious person. For s those of you in the audience didn't have never heard of the Templeton Prize, uh, Professor Towns was one of the recipient of the Templeton Prize for his contribution to promote understanding between religion and science. So one thing I have always intrigued me is uh, what is the source of the inspiration? You know, we talk about inspiration, but I wonder whether you have found that, you know, maybe say, after you are, say you are encountering a difficult problem and you cannot find a solution, you might have put this uh, problem in your prayer, and whether it has now contributed to uh, you finally getting some inspiration. I know it is a kind of question which is uh, slightly outside the domain of your talk today, but it has, uh, uh, this question has intrigued me uh, for many years because I used to be a very religious person myself. And uh, so I think you should be the best person to uh, provide the answer to this question. <laughs> That's a hard question to answer, but let me say yes, I am religiously oriented, and I feel that God has given me a great deal and help me a great deal, and I do pray for his help uh, in my life and in doing science. And uh, where the new ideas come from, and uh, what, does, what makes a good life? Well, that's interesting questions, and I, th I sort of sense an answer. I can't give you proof that, yes, God does, does this and that, but uh, I kind of sense that, yes, he has been help he's been helping me and I owe, I owe, owe, owe him a great deal. 
Thank you. Is there any, any more questions? Yes, and please state your name also. Uh, Charlie, it's uh, Bob Dibble from Mechanical Engineering. First of all, uh, a plug for your book, uh, everybody here. Uh, I believe your book's uh, How the Laser Happened. You printed that about eight years ago, Charlie. Is that about right? Yeah. yeah anyway, get that book. Uh, I was bringing my book here to this meeting for Charles to autograph. <laughs> but as I got it, I realized it already has his signature in it, OK? <laughs> so, so I don't know when that. Uh, have you had a chance to read a book that's gone around the last three years called Pastures Quadrant? No, I don't know that. Okay, I need to get that to you. It uh, discusses of, of uh, something we inherited. The, the book goes back and claims we inherited from the Greeks, and that is the notion that basic science is to be decoupled from the actual application. It's a topic that uh, the National Science Foundation and other agencies uh, in our government and other governments agonize over over the last uh, 50 to 100 years. Is, in to, to how much should we, should we hand money to people with no expectations whatsoever that something good will come out of it, uh, you know, a sort of undirected money, as opposed to how much money should we hand to people when we clearly have a goal in mind. And I think your topic brushes into that. Uh, you sound like you were let to go with microwave spectroscopy at Bell Labs, with Bell thinking really no expectation where this may come. And uh, of course, there's increasingly forces that say, you know, we, we have less and less of that kind of money available. More and more today, money is directed. Your comments. I'll, I'm, by the way, I will get you the book. Okay. <laughs> well, that, uh, that's a very important kind of question. Uh, now, if people think science would be decoupled from engineering and applications, I would say, well, yes and no. Actually, it needs to be very strongly coupled. And it is, but support of it should not depend on our trying to foresee its applications. We should support science as exploration and discovery. And you see, Bell Laboratories was willing to let me do this. They were open-minded. They didn't think it had applications. Mm -hmm. But look what it did. It very much changed the whole communications world. Uh, look what it did, and it meant something about labs in the long run, and I, I'm very appreciative of what they did. <coughs> Other companies wouldn't do it. And I think we all, I think our whole country and everybody uh, is troubled by that kind of short-sightedness. If we don't see a useful outcome with certain kinds of science, we might say, well, uh, we shouldn't bother to put money on that, we shouldn't support that. It won't have a useful outcome. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a great mistake. And we see over and over again uh, that science, in the long run, in exploring things, develops new things and finds new discoveries, completely revolutionizes our technology and, us, uh, and, and uh, our living. Uh, so exploration in itself is exceedingly important to human welfare, in addition to being interesting philosophically and emotionally and so on, is very, very important to human welfare, exploration in general, and trying to understand things. And uh, I think it's very important for us to convince our politicians and our businessmen and everyone, give, keep giving them examples and many, many, but it takes time. You see, you know, the trouble is some head of a company, he wants something that's going to happen in his, in his uh, time in office, which means within five or 10 years, uh, he would like something to happen. And so he doesn't want to put money on something that's going to maybe do something in the future. But somebody has to do it. And it does take frequently more than a decade for something to develop. Frequently takes more than a decade. But uh, maybe a couple of decades, two or three decades, and that's it. And so the country as a whole has a long lifetime, <laughs> and we need to support it. Again, you look at the laser, you see. I, um, I began microwave spectroscopy in 1945. Well, the laser idea came along, the laser idea, and the laser idea came along um, six years later. 
actual laser came along uh, about 12 years later. Uh, the laser idea and the real laser came along almost 19 years later. So, uh, and even then people say, well, what, what good can it do? It's a nice, nice invention, but what good can it do? Uh, now we know. Enormous variety of things. Laser has, oh, it's billions and billions of dollars in all kinds of different aspects of the lasers in, in industry now, and it's uh, very creative. And just recently, uh, been a uh, new discovery about making tiny little lasers which can transfer information very quickly from uh, from um, uh, one small piece of solid state information to, to, to others. It's transferring information very quickly. It's just coming along all the time. Uh, and um, billions and billions of dollars and also lots and lots of science. There have been about at least a dozen Nobel Prizes won as a result of the availability of mazes and lasers. They're using mazes and lasers and tools, you see. It gives us new science. So uh, the things we don't imagine uh, can be very, very important. We must keep open and we must, I, I hope we can convince our businessmen and our politicians and everyone, yes, we must, ex must support exploration, regardless of whether we see any immediate applications. Because in the long run, that's going to be very important to us. Is there any more questions? Any from the students, preferably? Well, I have, I have one then. Um, what, what specific advice would you give a new, com uh, new uh, graduate student? Well, I would say have a, have a good time in learning a lot. <laughs> Learning art, physics is fun. You know, I feel I, I've never really had to work in all my life, and somebody's paid me to do physics even. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, do the things you enjoy doing. Those are what, that's what you like to do best. And learn everything you can, and interact with people. Be close to people, talk with them, talk with them, and, and look at other fields and so on. Interact with different fields, interact with people. Learn as much as you can. You never know what this I, where, what this information or that information, what it's going to do for you. Learn as much as you can, learn as deeply as you can, think hard, work hard. See, I worked very hard to get the maze and the laser idea. I worked very hard and I wasn't very successful. I worked for several years and, on things. Work intensely and have fun with it and then ideas will come along. So the main thing is learn all you can, do what you enjoy doing, Learn what you can and uh, broaden out, and uh, that's what's going to make a make an interesting life. Is there any more questions? Well, then I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thank you, Professor Towns. <laughs>